Today, we are going to discuss how we conceptualize grief, both at an emotional and at a logical level. I'm going to teach you about the neuroscience and the psychology of grief and incredible findings that have been made in just a few key laboratories that point to the fact that we essentially map our experience of people in three dimensions. I'll just give you a little hint of what those dimensions are. They relate to space, where people are, time, when people are, I'll explain what that means, and a dimension called closeness, and how those three dimensions of space, time, and closeness are what establish very close bonds with people and are what require remapping, reorganization within our emotional framework and our logical framework when we lose somebody for whatever reason. Indeed, moving through grief requires a specific form of neuroplasticity, a reordering of brain connections, and also the connections between the brain and body. I'll also point out some of the myths about grief. For instance, many of you have probably heard that there are designated stages of grief that everybody moves through. It turns out that recent research refutes that idea. There are different stages of grief, but not everybody experiences all of them. And hardly ever does somebody move through all of those linearly, meaning in the same order. There's an important scientific literature that teaches us that how we show up to grief meaning our psychological and our biological state that we happen to be in when a loss occurs, strongly dictates whether or not we end up in what's called complicated or non-complicated grief. And non-complicated grief is a form of grief that is very prolonged. And in fact, often requires that people get substantial professional help. Everybody at some point in their life experiences grief, either mild grief, moderate grief, or extreme grief. And it's somewhat obvious, but worth stating nonetheless, that how intense grief feels and how long it lasts scales with how close we were with somebody. And if you learn that the person who works at the coffee shop or that you see at the coffee shop on a regular basis happened to pass away or tragically get killed in a car accident, that can be quite upsetting. It can be somewhat disorienting to you. If you, for instance, just saw them yesterday or uh, they seemed perfectly fine when you saw them last. But of course, the grief that results from the loss of somebody to whom you have that level of attachment is far and away different than the level of grief that you would experience from the death of a very close loved one, a sibling, a parent, God forbid, a child. When that type of loss occurs, it's often the case that our entire relationship to life feels different. Places and things that at once brought us joy and laughter now bring the opposite they bring us intense feelings of sadness and loss. Psychologists and neuroscientists distinguish between complicated grief and non-complicated grief. They are very similar at the outset. One of the fundamental differences between them, however, is that complicated grief, which occurs in about one in 10 people, is a situation in which grief does not seem to resolve itself even after a prolonged period of time. The important thing to point out is that grief is a process. Like any biological or psychological event, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I do believe that being able to orient in terms of where you are in that process can be immensely beneficial, not just for predicting how long it's going to last, but in order to conceptualize the person or animal that you lost in a way that allows you to best preserve their memory while maintaining your own functional capacity in life. Along those lines, I wanna point out that grief and depression while they can feel quite similar in certain ways and have overlapping symptomology, loss of appetite, challenges sleeping, crying in the middle of the day for no apparent reason, et cetera, they are distinctly different processes. Grief rarely responds well to antidepressants, whereas depression can often respond well to antidepressants. Everything we know and understand about grief is that it is a distinct psychological and physiological event in the brain and body from depression. Rather, perhaps the best way to think about grief is that it is actually a motivational state. It is a yearning, it is a desire for something. And somewhat surprisingly, it's not just a desire to have that person back or to have that animal back. You might think, well, that's crazy, of course it is. But of course, there are instances in which someone passing away or an animal passing away is actually providing relief for that person because of where they happen to be in their life. Grief as a motivational process 
really is the way that scientists and psychologists now conceptualize grief and the treatments for grief so that people can move through them effectively. I'd like to emphasize some of the common myths and misunderstandings about grief. Some of the myths and misunderstanding arrive from the beautiful work of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a psychologist who wrote the famous book on death and dying. And I should emphasize that while Kubler-Ross was a real pioneer in establishing that there are indeed different stages of grief, the modern science, both psychology and neuroscience, point to the fact that not everybody experiences all of the stages that Kubler-Ross defined, nor do they move through those stages in a linear manner. Sometimes they're out of sequence. I'll just highlight the five stages that Kubler-Ross illustrated. The different stages of grief very quickly are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. In the Kubler-Ross model, denial is always the first stage. And denial is just as it sounds, this disbelief. It cannot be. There's no way. A refusal to accept the new reality that the person or animal is gone. The second stage, anger, is one in which the individual recognizes that the person is indeed gone or the animal is gone, but their body and their mind go into a motivated state. This is important. We're going to return to this idea of grief as a motivated state that involves action plans in more depth as we go further. And then the third stage is bargaining, what's sometimes called the negotiating phase. This idea that, well, if I had just done this, or if they had just done that, or if I had called more, or somehow refusing to accept the reality. So in a way, this can be blended with denial in thinking, well, if I just don't think about it, it won't be real, this kind of thing. So again, stages can be blended or braided together because emotions are complex, right? Even though there are different stages to this process, they can sometimes be melded together. The fourth stage of depression that Kubler-Ross described is one of why go on living? Why should I go on living? Why should I continue in this grief stricken state that seems to deprive me of all the richness of life that I experienced when the person or animal was still here. And then the fifth stage is acceptance. This internalization, not just cognitively, not just thinking, but emotionally that it's going to be okay. That not just this too shall pass, but that it has passed. So again, the five stages of grief that Kubler-Ross defined were immensely important as a critical parsing of the different stages that one could move through. But unfortunately, those five stages were sort of taken to be gospel for a long time. And we now know based on neuroimaging, based on more in-depth psychological evaluation, and frankly, more researchers and clinicians moving into this area and observing that while much of what Kubler-Ross described does hold true, it's not always the case. And in fact, the contour of the grief process actually has a lot of dimensions that are not encapsulated by those five stages. There's also a lot of variation depending on whether or not the loss is due to old age, disease, whether or not there was suffering prior or not, suicide or non-suicide types, deaths and losses, and even grief about non-death losses. 